thank you so much for joining us today. We know how busy everybody is. It's the beginning of the semester for so many. And we know there's lots of pushes and pulls on your time, especially right now with everything that's going on. So we really appreciate you uh, and your time and that you've taken some time today to spend with us to learn more about transitioning to online learning, five things you need to know with Dr. Angie Smith. My name is Rhonda Dearborn. I'm the acquisitions editor for uh, behavioral sciences here at Springer Publishing. Uh, after today's presentation, if you do have any questions about adopting the book maybe for your doctoral level programs or any questions about maybe using the content from Angie's book for uh, continuing education or uh, using the book for presentations or for conferences or anything like that, you can also contact Lee Montville, our new business development manager. Our contact information is at the bottom of this slide that you're seeing right now. We will be taking questions and uh, doing a Q&A, taking questions, and we will do that at the conclusion of Angie's presentation. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A box that you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and please use that to pose any questions that you have for Angie. Please cite who you are and your affiliation, and uh, Lee will be uh, posing those questions to Angie at the conclusion of the presentation. I want you to know that the deck that we are seeing today that Angie has been so uh, generous with providing will be made available to you. An email will be going out tomorrow afternoon and you will get access to the deck that you will see today. And then in about seven to 10 business days, we will be disseminating out this presentation, the recorded presentation. So you will get that in about seven to 10 business days. Please, by all means, share it with colleagues. Uh, so yes, we're going to get started. Let me introduce our speaker today. We're so lucky to have her, uh, Dr. Angie Smith. She embraces multiple roles as a partner, mother, an associate teaching professor, program coordinator for the on-campus and online college counseling and student development program at North Carolina State University. She's also a licensed clinical mental health counselor, counselor supervisor and an approved clinical supervisor and national certified counselor. She has been teaching online and on campus at NC State University for 11 years and has worked in corporate environments, academia and college and counseling environments and private practice settings. She served as the Delta Distance Education Learning and Technology Applications Faculty Fellow, supporting all faculty at the university by sharing teaching strategies and creating and delivering courses using technology on campus and online. She serves on the review board for the Journal of Employment Counseling, uh, is the past president of the North Carolina Career Development Association, and is also a recipient of the National Board of Certified Counselors Approved Clinical Training Award. Dr. Smith co-authored Developing Online Learning in the Helping Professions, Online Blended and Hybrid Models, which is uh, the textbook that she published with us, I'm sorry, the book that she published with us. As a novice instructor in the counseling field over a decade ago, she searched for this type of book to support her work in teaching and training her graduate students. The book provides multiple voices from experts in the field and concrete examples that can be used and adapted based on the instructor's style and strength. So it can be used in the classroom as well as for professional practice. She and her partner, Jeff, recently celebrated in quarantine their 21st year anniversary and have three children who are now online learners in elementary and high school, Hannah 14, Ella 10, and Colton 8. For fun, she enjoys playing tennis, spending time with friends and family, volunteering with her kids, and spending time at the beach. So I'm going to now turn it on over to our presenter, Dr. Angie Smith. Thank you so much, Rhonda, for that warm welcome and introduction. I really appreciate you. Um, I wanted to start out today actually with gratitude and thank you to Springer Publishing and also Rhonda, Lee, Gina, and Andrew and all the team behind the scenes today. Um, I know that this takes a lot to put on a webinar, particularly during multiple pandemics. So I'm thoroughly grateful for the opportunity to talk about online learning and transitioning to the online platform. So thank you for, for everything. Um, 
Additionally, I would be remiss to not just um, take a moment and acknowledge all of the things that are happening um, around and through our, our community and our world at large. And so I wanted to take a moment just to recognize that I, I'm not talking about this presentation in a vacuum, but recognize that we have multiple pandemics occurring at once. And I know currently many of you might be joining um, from places that may be experiencing some of the, um, the climate issues as well, um, in addition to some of the other things with regard to COVID, um, with the racial inequities within our society, um, as well as employment um, concerns um, and unemployment issues in our country as well. So I, I come to you with with that in mind as we meet today and just want you to know that um, I know that you're serving maybe having in your own lives some things that are going on, but also serving others who may be experiencing a multitude of impacts from these things. So I just wanted to make sure that um, I highlight that as we get started. So as we get started, um, this is a topic and I want to preface this by saying that I get really excited about. So I'm going to try very, very hard to keep within the time frame and I could probably go more than five things. But when I boiled it down, I wanted to at least share with these five things with you. So one of the things that I thought about, um, ironically, as, as I was putting this together um, and thinking about our time together today, um, I was actually been working on it for a little bit and my um, my daughter that Rhonda had talked about, my middle daughter, Ella, Ella who's 10 years old, um, in the meantime had said to me, um, mom, I wanted to show you something. I created something for you. And I know that you're working on something about online stuff. And I was just thinking, you know, I would love for folks to know a little bit more about you. And, and it may be, you know, just something that is using technology. And so I asked um, Rhonda and the team, I said, well, should I show it as just kind of a way that technology is so pervasive? And this is something that she was doing behind the scenes. I had no idea. So I wanted to start out today just so you can get a little bit of a taste of a little bit more about from my daughter's perspective who I am um, and share this video with you just as a way to think about technology and how it's really showing up in so many different spaces. Even some of those spaces, I would say, um, that truly, you know, you may not even recognize that that we're, you know, there it's actually happening in the moment and your child may even tell you this is what I'm doing. All right, so I share that with you as I come to you with this topic um, that many of us are joining the online environment in vast and different ways, um, including our children. And so um, as Rhonda was talking about the multiple roles in which I am currently, many, like many of you are juggling at one time, one of those things happens to be kind of that as a mom. And so thinking about just how, you know, younger children are also involved in learning in this way right now, as we are as potentially instructors and faculty navigating at the same time. So I just wanted to share that out with you as we get started. Um, so one of the things that Rhonda had mentioned um, with regard to my background, I'm not going to go through all of it again, but I wanted to acknowledge that this this potential, you know, the book that we created was something that I didn't seek out to do. Um, I think the book found me versus me finding it. Um, and that's a whole other story for another day. But um, it really is a compilation of a lot of people who were really interested in this type of work back in about 2014. And it's really important um, to know, to kind of think about that in the perspective that I didn't actually create this idea, this book kind of in a vacuum, that I really reached out to so many people who were already doing the work. And so I kind of stand on their shoulders and and this is just something that has come out of that. And so I want to recognize and acknowledge um, the co-authors, Dr. Warren, Dr. Ting, and Dr. Um, Talia Farrow as well, as um, among many other folks that have helped to contribute to this, this particular publication. So um, to those, I'm so, I'm so I'm grateful. So I wanted to share that with you. I also want to, you to know from the lens in which I'm sharing this information, um, it's important to recognize, I think, that I'm, I am kind of in multiple roles at one time, like many of you might be at this time, as you may be, you know, kind of juggling holding a child, as you may be trying to prepare a late lunch. Um, there are so many other things that are happening while we're also in simultaneously teaching classes and going through and trying to do all the things um, simultaneously in these multiple roles, which can be very stressful. So I want you to kind of know that about me a little bit as, as we go forward and, and talk through these slides today. So this is just a little bit of a framework for our time together. Um, first, I want to thank you. I want to sincerely thank you for being here. There are a million places I'm sure that you could be today, and yet you're here, and you're also um, participating and engaging in this conversation that's an important one in light of all that's happening. Um, I hope that you feel welcome in this space, even in a virtual online environment, that you feel welcome and you can 
be here in whatever that looks like for you today. Um, I also want to, as a community, do what I actually do in my classes, which is the mental health check-in each time in our synchronous Zoom environment to see how we're doing collectively as a group. Because even though right now I can't see you, I know that you all are in different spaces and places with regard to your own situations. And it's important as a community to understand what that looks like so we can be attentive to those needs. Additionally, we have um, five kind of fund, um, foundational resources and tips. These are suggestions and things that I wanna offer to you as kind of just frameworks to be thinking about as you venture in or as you're currently teaching online. And then throughout, as we're weaving through the importance of self-care, um, it's in everything. And I know that self-care can be a pop culture term, but I think right now um, is a time for radical self-care um, and really kind of making sure that we're taking care of ourselves um, more than ever. So we'll kind of share a little bit about that. And then we'll end with a Q&A, and I hope that there'll be time for questions, and, and definitely I'm happy to answer any of those as we go forward. This quote here is one of my favorites from Maya Angelou, um, and I think that this really resonates with how I hope that you feel today. I really hope that after this session that you may forget some of the things I say, you may forget some of the things that um, I'm doing in this session, but I hope that you'll feel in such a way that you will be inspired to move on and take one of these pieces of um, nuggets and use it and apply it into your own work. So let's get started. First, again, thank you. Um, I found this um, through just social media outlets and this really resonated with me today when I was thinking about you all and where you are in your spaces as you think about moving into the distance learning environment. And I wanted to just let you know that sometimes we have to you know, kind of pause and think about and um, affirm that we're doing our best. Um, many of you may not have voluntarily decided to move your classes into the online environment. You may have you know, been um, in many ways um, just due to COVID and due to all the things that are happening in our academic environments. This is something that was, was kind of forced in many ways upon us. Um, so I wanted to just read this. I usually don't read my slides, but I think this one is one I hope you keep and remind yourself of. Particularly, there's going to be some really great days and there's going to be some really challenging days um, and hopefully more of the former than the latter. Um, but affirmations. So as I move into distance learning, I'm going to do the best that I can, I can do. I can only do the best that I can, right? How, um, how human of me to feel nervous about trying something new. Um, I will give myself the same grace as I give to others. I may not be able to control the situation, but I have control over my attitude. Um, and this is something I'm telling my children a lot. <laughs> um, this is only temporary, and that is, that's the hope here is it is temporary. I can do difficult things. Um, I don't have to figure it all out um, and can move forward in that. So I wanted to just kind of share some of these with you. Um, and then the final one, of course, being, I will make mistakes and that's okay. And I think that's the one I repeat to myself a lot, um, is that sometimes we have to take two steps back before we take three steps forward. So I hope this is helpful to you and just affirming that wherever you are in your journey of distance education, that, that you're doing the best that you can and that is good enough. So um, if you need to revisit this, you'll have this slide deck, feel free to use that as you go forward in your own journey through online education. All right, so in my own classes, I always like to start with a welcome and just hopefully kind of onboarding you into the space. I hope that you enjoyed the music as you entered. Um, setting the tone is so important as we invite our students um, who have a variety of different things going on in their life into our online and virtual spaces. So I hope that you do feel welcome. Um, we're gonna go ahead and launch this poll, which is our mental health check-in poll. It's anonymous and it's an opportunity, an opportunity for you to engage with us and let, you, let us know how you're feeling. So how are you doing today? And really, how are you doing today? So thinking about how you're um, feeling as you're, um, as you're joining our session for today. And I'll pause for a moment to give you a, some time to go ahead and make your selection. So it looks like um, in terms of the, the polling responses, um, it looks like we're kind of, we're all over the map. Um, we have, you know, some folks that are feeling great, some that are pretty good, some that are okay, some that are struggling, and some that are having a really hard time. So in my classes, I always tell folks that, you know, it's important to be mindful of how people are joining the spaces and also just be attentive to those individualized needs in our room um, because we know that people are coming to us um, in a variety of different ways and so we want to be supportive and open um, and offer support and resources wherever we can. So wherever you are in the spectrum, um, I hope that you're able to reach out and, and latch on to your support structures and also um, just continue to 
identify ways um, for your own self-care throughout this. So thank you so much for sharing that. Additionally, with the mental health check-in, I wanted to mention for today, at any point, if you need to take care of yourself, please do it. I think it's important to think about, you know, your, your water intake. If you need to blink your eyes, especially right now, I was reading an article about just our eye strain right now. Zoom fatigue is real. Um, do anything that you need to do to take care of yourself in the moment during our time together today. It's so important. And as instructors and as individuals, modeling that for our students is really important. So please um, do that today at any point as you need to. All right, so our next poll, I wanted to just learn a little bit about who we have the privilege of spending our time with today. So this poll, just you might, knowing that you might serve in multiple roles in your, in your life, um, we understand that too. Um, the one that you might wanna to select today that's most salient for you right now, um, just to give us an idea about who's in the room. So if you wanna go ahead and take a moment to make your selection. Um, but let me know if I can recalibrate. Um, but I'm looking at right now is um, the host um, information, so you, so you know that, and um, what's kind of going on with who's in the room today. And so it looks like the majority here are counselor educators. We have some administrators, some counselors, some instructors, um, and some staff, and um, some students. So welcome to you all. I'm so glad that you're here, and I hope that each of you has an opportunity to take something away from today that will help you in your work or personally in your own personal life. All right, so let's go ahead and we're gonna move on to the next slide. So I wanna start by first telling you a story. I want, to, um, I want to go ahead and share with you in March 2020, or March 2020 how, um, as we know, everything is happening um, and COVID is, is coming into play. Um, this is how I felt. Um, I was teaching two classes and we were going into um, the semester and um, just trying to figure out um, what was I going to do? Because I know from a counselor perspective that I need to be thinking about students um, showing up in different spaces. And so one of the things that I wanted to share with you is that at, the, at that time I was going to be teaching a couple courses um, in the summer. And so I decided to really think about from our own training, a trauma informed approach. And so in doing so, I completely revamped my syllabus and went ahead and decided to go ahead and start thinking about and researching a lot of different trauma-informed teaching practices to implement into my courses. And so some of that today is going to be what I'm going to be sharing with you from an online course perspective. So let me go ahead and advance this for you. So for today, as far as some tips and resources, I just want to share with you a couple of suggestions. Um, and some things I wanna share with you about learning in this environment, particularly during uncertain times. Number one, embracing empathy and grace as number one and for, first and foremost. I always tell instructors that I work with is that you are the instrument, you are the expert, and hum the humanity of everything is first. Secondary is the technology. So embracing and, the, and being that of grace is so important. Taking a pause and a breath and a time to plan and adjust is our second one we'll cover. I'm also going to share with you some technology considerations as well and also some course design tips that will hopefully help you as you think through designing and implementing your courses or updating them as well. And finally, um, probably my favorite is building an engaging online community. Um, this is something I think as counselors and counselor educators that we do really well, and it's now bringing that light and, and love and our, um, our interest in the field into the online environment too. And then throughout all of this, thinking about self-care practices and strategies. So I'd like to begin, number one, with um, the posture of empathy and grace. I think coming from a trauma-informed lens and using these six guiding principles as we develop our courses right now can be really helpful. Um, you may have seen this, some of you may use the six principles in your own work as you think about your own um, experiences and working with your students. And so the CDC and the Office of Public Health and Preparedness Response, as well as SAMHSA, um, has come up with these six principles that really help to guide the work um, that I've kind of been thinking about as I, I construct and reconstruct my online classes. So coming from the posture of creating a safe space, offering trustworthiness and transparency, building in opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer support, providing collaboration with students and among students, um, having empowerment situations where students have a voice and a choice in their learning. And then above all, thinking about this, all this whole model through a cultural lens and from historical and gender, um, gender issues as well. So kind of coming through that. So as I share this with you, how might you frame your course to ensure the inclusion of these, 
these specific domains. And my hope is that you'll be able to incorporate some of these, these parts of these six principles into your own teaching and as you guide um, your learning with your students. So this is how it looks like in my class and some of the things that I've done. Um, there's just a few things. Um, very early on is to, before the semester even starts, is to create a, a welcome letter and a video. I want students to be able to see my face, hear my voice, and be able to understand who I am as an instructor. Sometimes that's vulnerable. Sometimes that's sharing some things um, that are happening um, in the situation where I may be talking about, you know, I'm currently in this part of the semester and there's some things that I'm, you know, I'm working on as well in relationship to my own students and their learning. And so sharing some things with, with our students too, to create that space and building rapport with them. Additionally, um, one of the things I do in my first asynchronous class is open the session for 10 to 30 minutes. And this is really to create that environment like you would in an on-campus classroom where students can come in, they can share out with you, um, they can also, um, and you may not even be in the room yet, but it kind of is that water cooler feel. So opening the Zoom space or synchronous space that you're using a little bit early so students can engage and connect in a way that will allow them to be able to make those connections um, virtually even. And then the use of peer support in breakout rooms. So developing breakout rooms and dyads or triads to have those conversations with students and even putting a prompt or even an icebreaker activity in those breakout rooms to have them to dialogue and talk about things that will help them to build community and connection. And then finally, the, the other thing that I wanted to share with you with regard to goals is that in terms of our meetings, I always say the first thing that I um, let students know is that before in my welcome letter is the one goal that I have um, for our time together in our first meeting is two things and the two B's, to build community and to understand the environment in which we in, we're in. And this very much parallels when we think about counseling, how we build rapport and relationship and trust with our students from the very beginning. What I don't want to happen is the students to come to that first class and miss out on the opportunity to be able to connect with the content that first class, and maybe they add the class later, maybe there are certain situations in their life that prevent them from being in that first class, and then they're already feeling behind in that first class in the semester. So I wanted to share that a little bit with you about that. Number two um, that I want to share with you is as we move into this this specific time of transition, it is so important to pause and just take a moment to think about how you're feeling about all of this. Um, this is a very challenging time as we know. And so thinking about how is this impacting you as the instructor, as the person who is coming in to the classroom and um, connecting with your students. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, we are we're the human the humanity of it is the most important the technology is secondary so thinking about the pedagogy first and connecting with our students and developing that relationship is paramount to whatever technology that you're going to use and then breathing and taking in a breath and just recognizing that you know there are going to be some ups and downs um, for both you and your students but knowing that you're in it together and having this posture of flexibility and resilience um, and as much as you can, and given the, the current circumstances. Um, and then plan as much as you can. Sometimes you may be at a plan, sometimes you cannot. It just depends on the situation. Um, and you can plan the best, you know, plan the best you can, and then adjust, readjust, and recalibrate. So the check-in, and I'm gonna share this with you, um, and you're gonna have this whole slide deck, is the check-in that I do is I actually have a welcome letter, and then I also embed it with a Google, a Google um, form that asks students about how they're doing. This helps me in a couple ways. I get to understand how students are showing up in the space um, before they come into the semester. And secondly, I also can readjust my syllabus before the semester if I understand there's students that are coming into our classroom, virtual or otherwise, with different kinds of experiences. So I'll share that with you. It's, it'll be a hyperlink um, in this slide, so you're more than welcome to take that, adapt it, use it to your, use it however it would be helpful to you. So again, this check-in, check-in on yourself, check-in on your students, use that welcome letter um, and that can really help to be concise and clear about the expectations and also it sets the tone for the remainder of your semester. So I hope that that's helpful. Also in that letter, I, I definitely recommend you to also highlight the resources in your campus and the community and in the state um, and anything that would be useful with regard to resources very early on in the semester. I think that this helps, again, set the tone for students that you're there, that you care, that you want to share out resources with them. 
So as a reflection, you'll be thinking about how you can set that tone for your online class and what that might look like for you. All right. So again, in this Google form, I wanted to just let you know you'll be having this in the, in the resource section as well, but um, I also just invite you to share with students and ask them these questions, and then based on that, those questions, you can go ahead and, and share that feedback. Some of the things and suggestions I wanted to mention to you as you create your um, as you create your syllabus and as you move forward and readjust is that one of the things obviously is KCREP accreditation and ensuring that we're aligning with those but also thinking about how we can deliver and offer a variety of choices for students to be able to demonstrate their knowledge and, and demonstrate that they've, they've received the information in different ways. So one of the things I've done in my syllabus is, is provide a variety of choices for students to be able to engage with content in multiple ways. So one of the assignments that I have is an autobiographical statement um, for an intro class that I, that I teach. And this, sum, this summer was a five week course in two sections. One of the things that I had done, typically this is more of a written type of paper where they reflect and it's a personal journey, but allowing them the opportunity to use a variety of different ways to share out and meet those criteria. So they might use a Flipgrid, which is um, one of the um, video prompts that they could use and share out in that way. They could use VoiceThread, which is another type of um, kind of built in at NC State, we actually have um, a license for that to be able to use um, VoiceThread in our, in our work. And um, you can use it as a discussion forum board, but you also can use it as a recording. Um, and then there's others, whatever they have as far as technology or any technology that may be helpful for students. They also can use a PowerPoint and narrate that. Um, they could also use something like a Padlet, which is essentially blocks of um, it look, almost looks like post-it notes and kind of lay out their journey on those post-it notes. Lino is very similar. If you've ever used Lino, it's, it is actually a board with post-it notes on it. Um, and also a Jamboard is another type of feature that allows you to be able to forecast and share out a variety of information um, on one screen. You can put pictures in there, you can put um, content and text and all sorts of things. So asking students kind of what their preferred method of sharing information with you can also be really helpful early on and what they have available to them with regard to technology, given that many of them are working and operating from home. Another, um, another thing I wanted to mention is creating a master calendar and a tentative learning agenda. And this master calendar, particularly in times like we're in, helps everyone to literally be on the same page. So as things readjust and recalibrate, as they do, I know at NC State, we just found out that we're not gonna have class next week for a couple days. I just found out right before this session. Um, being able to have that one document and being able to share that out with the students as a Google Doc or a Google Slide or whatever format would be helpful for you. So be thinking about how you can adjust and adapt your syllabus um, or course plan um, to vary based on where, how your students show up to class. All right, so for technology and technology questions and considerations, I'm not gonna share with you, this is exactly the technology you should use because I think at your institutions, many of you um, are using technologies that are supported through your, through your institutions. So I just wanted to offer you some just very brief questions here of consideration of how you feel about um, the technology and how you're planning to use it. So for example, what technology does your institution use and how is it supported? So your learning management system, um, that may be something that's already built into the, what, the way that your institution is offering information and supported and they can support you too. Additionally, you know, thinking about um, what technology do students have access to? What, what technology do students need as well? Um, and thinking about how students from a universal design can access this technology and making it accessible for a variety of different students who are showing up into your classroom virtually. And also pausing and thinking about what is it with your own comfort level with technology? How do you feel about engaging with technology and ensuring that um, you're able to kind of meet the needs of some of the, some of the students that may have questions in your class? And what trainings might you need to consider at your institution or elsewhere to kind of make sure that you're feeling comfortable as well? All right, um, here are some suggestions for technology. So one of the things that I did when I first started teaching online was I wanted all the bells and whistles. I wanted to add everything in. I wanted it to be a certain way. I wanted to add all of the different types of technology to, to allow students all these different experiences. And I think what I learned from that was take baby steps, add something one 
step at a time. Um, and, and definitely think about kind of how this is going to drive, your pedagogy is going to drive kind of what technology that you're going to use based on the situation. So for example, um, you know, if you want to have students to connect in an asynchronous form, maybe a Google slide and having students to add their pictures or adding a prompt and having students add to that that prompt in your asynchronous environment may be a way to do that, whereas you may not need all kinds of different tools to be able to kind of achieve that goal. Additionally, um, I mentioned this several times, but I think, again, I don't think you can say it enough, is that we're, we're, we're the instrument in the classroom. We're the ones that we're bringing our experience and our whole selves and all our identity into the space with our students. So remembering that, that the human first, and then the technology is kind of help, like helping us to deliver that information. I would just implore you, and you're already here, so I don't, this is like speaking to the choir, I know, but continuously updating and, and attending webinars and things um, on all different types of online learning, and just in general, I think it helps us to stay current. Um, also considering the confidentiality and limitations, obviously within our field, that is a huge um, consideration, but also thinking about the limitations and confidentiality as it relates to um, the types of technology that you're going to use and what that's going to look like based on the classes that you're going to teach. I really um, also like to suggest to, to you to think about instructional designers, librarians. I hope cannot do what I do at my university without folks from Delta and the folks that are um, just so resourceful and know a lot about instructional design and some of those things that are really helpful as we move forward in our classes. And then practice. We love play. Kids learn from play. So practice in the sandbox. Um, try it out when you can. Um, try it out with your kids or, um, or your partners or others that may want to test it out and see how, how it goes. So just wanted to share a few technology considerations as you move forward. As I do in my class, I like to pause. Um, I know it's a lot of information in a very short period of time. So um, I do this sometimes in my classes where just taking a 20 second pause break. So this is just, and using some humor a little bit, this student here on this slide um, was quite creative and ended up in Zoom and um, renamed themselves to reconnecting. So it appeared as if the instructor did not necessarily um, know that they were there. So I guess that was it assumed that the student hasn't really showed up yet. So I uh, wanted to share that with you as we, as we kind of move forward. So just take a moment to pause, get a drink, um, blink your eyes, um, and just take a moment um, to breathe. All right, thank you for that. Um, so for the fourth one, the fourth tip I wanted to share is with regard to course design. So this is actually on the right hand side, you'll see this, this slide deck here of all the different images. I wanted to give a huge kudos and shout out to actually Delta um, and NC State. They have um, an amazing intern that had worked with me on creating the tone to my asynchronous class. And so they actually created this by hand and I had asked about creating a very warm, welcoming, inviting space for students to be able to engage each week and look forward to opening the next week's session. And so we were able to embed for week one, two, three, four, and five, these specific headers so that students could see and feel um, the tone of the course. So something to think about, you know, as you think about your asynchronous spaces and the spaces as you're building your content and your design, how do you want your students to feel as they enter their asynchronous space? And how can your learning management system help you to create the space that you're longing for for your students as they enter in? Um, so those are some things just to be thinking about as kind of a backdrop. Um, additionally, when we think about some tips um, as well is one of the things that I learned I think that is really important as you develop any course is looking at a course map and thinking about that map and how you want to almost think about the back end design. So what do you want your learning outcomes to look like and how are we going to move forward um, in, in aligning all of our assessments, all of the learning materials that we use, um, our sessions with our students, and of course the alignment between KCREP and the requirements for our field. And so this can be a really helpful and useful tool that allows you to be able to see the whole course and you can build it out if it's something that you're building from, from scratch. Um, of course, you can always adapt it and um, continue to evolve the course if you already have one that's already created and just continue to use that course map to make adjustments and adaptations. So some of the things that may be on that course map um, may be the learning objectives and those are bus for learning objectives that can really, some of which may come directly from KCREP. And then of course, thinking about your expectations of the class and what you want the class to, to feel like, what you want um, students to gain from the class and what technologies you might need to use in order to, to um, meet those goals. 
um, underlying thinking about the accessibility and how can students um, ensure that they're able to retrieve and, and use the information in the spaces that they're in, either, um, either in Zoom, via captioning, or in other spaces as well. Um, also thinking about the course materials, how you want to have assessments. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to always be a quiz that's embedded into the asynchronous environment. There can be a variety of assessment instruments and tools. Um, I know in our learning management system, there's built-in rubrics that you can actually create rubrics that will allow you to easily um, grade assignments um, that will help you to ease some of that, that load as you think about grading. And then as you go through continuing to reflect on the process, and throughout the, the whole time asking for student feedback. Um, and you can do this asynchronously or you can do this synchronously. Um, in my synchronous classes, sometimes I will um, ask students, I'll give a thermometer and say kind of where on the thermometer are we? You know, are we going too fast, too slow? How are you feeling about the content? Depending on the prompt, um, using that visual can be really helpful. Um, other times I've used a roller coaster as a visual and kind of asking them kind of where, how are you feeling on this? Are you in the, the top end, the, you know, where are you kind of in the dip, where we're kind of all coming down? Where are you in that too? Um, and then I wanted to just pinpoint quality matters as a faculty driven um, rubric um, and set of standards that it's the gold standard for our profession, um, not just our profession, but in terms of online learning and development. And so if you're interested in that, your universities may have um, a quality matters expert or someone you might want to talk to about taking your course through that process. It's pretty laborious, but it really can um, touch on all those standards that are so important as we develop online learning. So I wanted to give you some concrete examples. Um, part of the rationale for um, actually offering this webinar is really giving you some concrete things you can use and take with you. Um, one of the things that I've done over the course of the last several years is I want to provide you with some examples that you can embed in your asynchronous environments. So number one, um, each of the weeks I've started to embed different types of opportunities for students to engage with a variety of different mediums. So one of those being these coloring pages. So I've even offered um, adult coloring pages, children coloring pages, and this is optional. So they can download these, they can work on it together, they can work as a family. Um, right now, just having something that's tangible, I think can be really important for students. And they seem to really enjoy it. Um, the other thing that, I, that I've added is mindful moments. And this could take on either a, a video, um, it may be something that I lead that I add to the week on top of the content that is a mindful moment to help them define their center and define peace um, and hopefully just carve out a few moments, whether it's a minute or two or three um, in, in the actual asynchronous session and I embed that, embed that into the asynchronous um, learning management system. And then finally, another idea that you might want to consider is we have so many folks in our field, as you know, many of you are here today, who are phenomenal experts in our field. And so what I had decided to do this summer um, in light of everything is I thought I'm going to reach out to some of the folks that I connect with and that I know um, are just phenomenal professionals um, in all different spectrums, school, clinical, mental health, um, college counseling, and, and the gamut. And I asked them if they could do a four to five minute video um, for me. And I asked five questions of them to talk about what it's like for them in the profession, why they joined, what populations they work with, um, how they're dealing with the multiple pandemics that are going on in our society, and share that out um, in a very informal way with students. And not one of them said no. Every single one of them said yes. And I was just so touched by the fact that they, they did that and they shared that, that information. Students absolutely loved that. Um, and so I added that to my, my LMS and um, each week students were excited. They wanted to come and see um, who was gonna be the next person um, that was gonna be sharing out their story. And so that's another tip that may be helpful for you is connecting the community into your classes and kind of showing students the broader strokes of um, all the different options within our field. Um, one bonus tip, don't try to replicate everything you're doing on campus. Um, if you've been teaching on campus for a while, don't try to just make it exactly the same as online. So um, think about how you can either flip it, um, flip portions of it, and be creative um, as you think about that as well. I also would say, as you're probably experiencing right now, Zoom fatigue is real. Um, I feel like I've been on Zoom for so many hours, and I'm sure all of you have been too. Um, and so Thinking about the time if you're offering a synchronous class and really being specific about designing that course in a way that doesn't promote fatigue, but rather helps students to take breaks and move forward. All right. Um, and then finally, the last tip is building community, which is we're all really 
great at this, right? We, this is what we do. We are all um, advocates and, and part of our profession. This is what we do, I think, really well. And you're able to do this in mu a multitude of ways, both on campus and now, of course, online. Um, it starts with you. It really does. Really sometimes thinking about who you are, all the different identities that you bring into the classroom and how you show up is so important in building community. Um, I've, I've done so many different things over the years with sharing, um, sharing if I'm actually on a conference, actually taping the conference and saying, you're with me. Here we are online. I'm right now at ACES. Check it out. Here's where we are. Bringing students into that space and being able to video it and showing them a variety of different ways um, that we engage with our profession. Um, also being vulnerable. I know that that can be sometimes scary, um, but you, even in small, <laughs> even in small um, pieces, being vulnerable and sharing a little bit of yourself. Um, additionally, thinking about um, your hobbies and what you want to share. Um, I started playing tennis a couple years ago, which was very kind of interesting um, and as, you know, as an adult now. And so talking about, gosh, starting new things can be hard and I'm enjoying it, but it's self-care and talking about that and relating to students in that way. Or travels right now may be challenging, but maybe um, thinking about even adding an icebreaker where, you know, where was your favorite place that you traveled in the past or the favorite place that you would go um, that brought you joy or brought a smile to your face? I love quotes. And so every single note and announcement that I um, provide to students, I have a quote at the bottom. So some people have like turtles or memes. Um, think about how you're um, communicating with students and bringing yourself into that space and building community from that, that starting point. So making connections and fostering relationships. Um, again, I wanted to just share out a few examples for you. Um, the correspondence that you have, I think if you even do videos, some of them are embedded into your, into your LMS and sharing out a week to week what to expect can be really helpful for students as just seeing you and making sure that you're not being silent and you're not kind of out there in cyberspace and they don't know where you are. So seeing you and having those um, touch points, one of the things that I did this summer um, during, um, during the class I taught that was the summer session in five weeks is that I would go on walks and I actually use VoiceThread on my app and I would tape myself and I would, I had a small class and for each of, during my walks, I would have certain things that I would refer to in the discussion board or the discussion we were having in class and I would talk to the student one minute or less and then send them that clip. Um, and they love that. First of all, I brought the outdoors in um, and that was something that was helpful, particularly everything that was going on this summer too. So that's just an idea to kind of think about using the different elements and using technology to really connect with your students and build that community. Um, additionally, you can use Google Docs as well. Um, Google Docs in so many different ways for introductions in asynchronous environments. I've used them as Google Slides and posted my family picture, maybe posted some things about, you know, um, my background and all the different places that I've worked and the populations I've served. And then also maybe said something fun about what I'm doing this, you know, what I'm doing in the moment. Um, my favorite food, and then um, created slides for each of the students in the class to add their own story and add to each other and respond to each other in that way from that Google Deck. And that's been really helpful to make connections asynchronously. I think synchronously too, um, including things like music like we did today, incorporating the five, you know, five senses and, and ensuring that we're tapping into all of those for our students. I'm um, incorporating activities that um, sometimes could be icebreakers, um, even just having a question on your first slide in your synchronous environment that prompts students to be thinking before they actually start the class and enter the space can be really useful too. Um, and then using breakout rooms. I think I use breakout rooms, probably overdo breakout rooms, but I think that it's definitely something that helps students to connect in small groups. When I provide supervision to students in my internship supervision class, we actually start out our sessions in breakout rooms. And we actually help have those conversations, just do the check-in together in small groups before we come out into the large group. So just something to think about. Um, and then continue to check in with each other throughout the semester. This slide here, I'm not going to go through all of it, but I probably could tell you more about what I've done incorrectly and what I've learned from than what I probably what I do at this point. But one of the things I think is most important is think about um, right now, less is more and Zoom fatigue is real. And so take care and attend to yourself as you think about Zoom 
and what it does for us in the space, in the back-to-back -back meetings, and how we can carve out time to be able to do stretch breaks. Um, we can press that pause button like I showed you and really kind of infuse that into our sessions um, so that students um, don't have that fatigue because they're going to be in essentially meetings all day just like many of us. And then here finally, I wanted to just offer as we close out just some self-care things to think about. Um, this is, of course, a grounding exercise that you'll have in your slide. Um, but again, reflecting on how can we ensure we're taking care of ourselves and our students. Sometimes we have to press the pause button and disconnect and move to something different for a while, and that's okay. And then this idea of radical self-care now is more important than ever. I think that this radical self-care right now um, is where we should be given in light of all the things that are happening around and within our communities. Um, the stop kind of doom scrolling, doom scrolling is where you kind of go into that rabbit hole and kind of you know, trying to be aware of that and stopping that before you go kind of too far into that. Um, and then this is just more of a reminder to pick something or pick a few things each day that hopefully will fill you up and bring you joy. So as a recap, um, I hope that you've had a chance to check in and think about yourself, think about your students, um, think about your courses and think about how you're delivering your content from a trauma-informed perspective. Those five tips about engaging with students, knowing that you are the expert, you're the instrument that's coming into the field and sharing with students and you're bringing your authentic self. And that's right now sometimes the, what we need the very most. Um, we can't pour from an empty cup. So I wish you all the best and wish you well as you continue to um, take care of yourselves in this moment. So today I hope that we met these goals. Hope you felt welcome. I hope that you're able to check in just even for this hour and see how you're doing offer you some music, thinking about how to infuse it for yourself in your own life, but also in the lives of your students as you teach them, different ways to build connections, knowing that it could be the roller coaster ride some days, but it doesn't always, there's always a stop and a start to a roller coaster, and hopefully we don't continue to go on it for too long, um, but recognizing that, that some days you may feel that way, but in the end, I hope that there's always growth and love and compassion as you continue to work through um, everything that you have going on right now in your classes and throughout the semester. So as we conclude, I hope there's been one question or takeaway or resource or idea that you can take with you. And with that, this is the list of resources that are hyperlinked. So you can have all of these as you move through into all the things that you're going to do as we close out this um, semester. And with that, we'll have the Q&A. Thanks very much. This is Lee Montville over with Springer Publishing. Um, first and foremost, I want to let everybody know that we will be um, emailing everyone the slides tomorrow. So stay tuned for those. If you have any questions um, regarding, uh, regarding the slides, feel free to reach out to Angie. You'll have her information. As Rhonda mentioned before, she's on our editorial side, and then feel free to reach out to me, Lee Montville, and my info's on there if you have any questions regarding sales. Um, thank you for all of your comments, your uh, kudos, and your kind words. And so we have a couple minutes for questions. So Angie, the first thing was, um, was a comment, but I thought that it could be a good question. So Kathy, um, found the idea of creating an introductory video created more anxiety for her. Um, she wasn't able to do it, although she has done it in the past. Do you have any additional recommendations or suggestions for a great intro? Yes, I, I do. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I know I don't know why my audio is doing some things, so I do apologize for that. This is the world of technology, um, and we do have four other learners in our house now, so that could be part of it <laughs> as well. Um, so yes, um, I think that's a great question um, with regard to introductions. I, I, again, I go from less is more. I think that one of the things that I tend to do, um, I think I even did this semester for this time around, is it doesn't have to be very long. It doesn't have to be um, anything that is really detailed. But in terms of your introductions, you can do something that is even embedded in your LMS and your learning management system. So in Moodle, I know we have a little 
camera where you can actually just record right within your announcement. And so I actually, what I will do is I'll type a message to students and then I'll click it on for less than a minute and you just give a high level recap of what it is that I would like for them to kind of know for that week. Um, so it's nothing too long. I think the, the shorter the better given our attention spans. And so I hope that, I hope that that's helpful. Um, also with introductions, even within the synchronous space, sometimes you can go forward and um, have times for introduction and do some fun things in the synchronous space. So for example, um, you know, talking about, you know, well, what's your, what was your favorite place to travel? And then have them introductions and have them go into breakout rooms, talk about it, and then introduce each other and do almost like a, a pair share um, experience. Um, lots of fun things I think you can also use for different kinds of video. I don't know if you ever use Flipgrid. Flipgrid can be super fun to use and actually students can comment on each other's and comment on your your intro to you. Um, and that's that can be a real nice way to just just visually show up in your classrooms, Kathy. Happy to share with you more too, by the way, if you want to email me. Thanks, Angie. Um, so Cindy mentioned regarding Zoom or other platforms, classes, labs, what suggestions do you have for attendance? Sometimes it's mandatory in labs, like mandatory showing yourself on screen. What would you recommend? That's a great question with attendance. So I've changed my, my thoughts on attendance as we go through, you know, since March. Um, so one of the things that I've, I've shared with regard to attending is my expectations from the beginning, that communication is key. So the expectation is that you would, you would hopefully be there, um, but kind of being a little bit more um, loose on whether or not they have to have their camera visual as an aid to ensure that they're there. Um, but I, what I do is on the back end is I go into the chat box and I go in and actually type in the chat box to ensure that they're there. So I will go back in the private chat and say, hi, I just wanted to just see how you're doing. I noticed that your, you know, your video's not on. I just, I care about you. How are you doing today? And, um, and that sometimes can kind of continue to ensure that they're there. Um, I also, with attendance to, I have a discussion about it early on in this semester to talk about what are the limitations of, of um, attendance right now? What's the communication that we want to bring into our space as we start this semester together? Because I know that my attendance may be compromised as well, given where we are. You just never know right now. So how are we gonna deal with that as we progress together as a community into the semester? So I think it's a great question. Um, continuing to dialogue with our students about how, how we're gonna show up, what that's gonna look like, what are the limitations, and what's the expectation, knowing that we may have to ebb and flow based on what's happening in front of us. That's great. And um, another, we got a great comment from Christiana, which is really likes the idea of community counselor spotlight on a weekly basis. And she's going to be incorporating that into her course. So oh, great. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for um, that. Thank you. Uh, so uh, you mentioned a little bit on about this uh, just a couple minutes ago, but we have uh, another comment or question from Zara, which is um, she's an educator in healthcare and often finds participants to be silent as the president, as the presentations happen. Do you have any suggest additional suggestions for drawing participate participants in to interact? Zara, that's a great question. That's a great question. I think. Part of why I spent so much time, by the way, on the front end of telling you about myself is very intentional, by the way. I know I spent a lot of time telling you that, but that's part of building the relationship. So if you tell them a little bit more about yourself, the likelihood of your students wanting to connect with you on one of those things that you've said can really can really pay dividends. So I think part of um, making those connections and drawing students out is building smaller connections first. So if you can create um, a prompt or a question or something that is gonna help them to start dialoguing in smaller groups first, then the likelihood of them coming back into the large group ends up being a little bit more chatty um, from my experience over the last decade is that you kind of get them in the small groups and then they come back and then they, they want to keep talking because they were on a roll. And so if you can create those small spaces early on, it ends up translating into more participation in the larger space um, in, in other conversations later, if that makes sense. I hope that helps. Um, answer yeah. that. That's great. Thank you. Um, we have a follow-up question from Kathy. How do you deal with feeling like you need to be an octopus to handle all the different tasks 
and things to pay atten attention to while online synch synchronously? Gosh, that's a great question, Kathy. Um, I say that my best preparation and training has come from being a mom of three sometimes because I feel like that octopus that you just described <laughs> um, and trying to, you know, be in different places and multiple times, sometimes at the same moment. Um, and so number one, the first thing I shared with you is give yourself grace and empathy as you would to others. And so I, I acknowledge it. I say that and sometimes I'll say, I feel like I am on um, a plane right now and I'm the pilot and there's multiple things happening. And so I verbalize it to my students. So they oftentimes will give me more grace because they recognize, and I took a picture one time, this is several years back of my screen to show them all the things that are going on and what I'm juggling. And they never knew. So sometimes giving them a little bit of a bird's eye view and a glimpse into your space can really provide a lot of empathy for you with your students um, and just taking it one step at a time and saying, you know, that this is, you're trying the best that you can given all the different things that you're working on. And if someone doesn't, you know, has, ask a question of you in the chat and you miss it, give them an alternative. You know, if I don't see you in the chat, go ahead and raise your hand. That is completely fine. Um, if you have a small group, maybe even invite them and, and kind of make sure that they're aware that they can go ahead and call out. And um, if that's, if you feel comfortable with that. So depending on what your expectations are and what you feel most comfortable with, setting the tone in that way and setting those expectations so your students know how to engage in that synchronous space. But I hear you. It is octopus with multiple arms um, all over the place. So Perfect. Thank you, Angie. And we have time for one more question from Cindy, which is, do you have any guide, guidelines about recording sessions by instructor or student and any related policies re where these recordings are stored? Yes. So I do not record my sessions that are for internship um, due to the fact that I just do not want that recording because of the nature of the information that's being shared about clients and students that the counselor and training are sharing out. So I do not record, I do not record those um, for that reason, um, just because of the nature of online learning and technology. So I, I do not um, record those in the synchronous sessions when we're live um, with regard to, there was a second part of that question, Lee, is that what, there's a second part to that? Um, yes. And like was, the screen, sorry. And, <laughs> and no, that's okay. And any related policies where the recordings are stored. So like mm -hmm. in the, in Cindy's, she mentions like a country, like if it's, you know. Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's a great question. So I think it depends on your university and you're going to want to check with that. Um, one of the things that our institution had, um, instituted early on was an iPad distribution, and that iPad is actually encrypted. So students actually have an iPad where they're, where they're actually using that iPad with their recordings. So it's an encryption process, and that's the policy is that students are, they have that iPad, and then they need to return that iPad after the coursework is completed. And so it is a policy and procedure that they need to use that iPad with that encryption process on it based on the institutional guidelines. Great. I check with your institution to see if there's something similar, or maybe something that can be put into place that might help in that regard too. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Angie. Mm -hmm. I just want to take a quick minute to remind everybody that you will be receiving the slides tomorrow and that we will be emailing all of you the audio within seven to 10 business days. Um, you can see here, if you have any additional questions, you have uh, Angie's contact information, Rhonda's contact information, and mine. Um, I also want to thank you again, Angie, for your presentation today to the team here at Springer Publishing and to all of you who took the time to join us today. We appreciate the important roles that you play for all of us. So thanks very much. Thank and you we, all so much. And we wish you all a great afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be well.